Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to properly shield clock lines on high-speed buses, specifically single-ended clock lines. Now, those of you who follow me on social media know that I am very active on LinkedIn. And of course, I saw a great LinkedIn post recently that was posing this exact question. So, what is the best solution to implement to shield clock lines from other signal traces in your PCB. Should you use coplanar ground? Should you just bring the ground closer to the clock line? Should you widen out the trace? Should you use guard traces? We're going to investigate that in this video. Let's get started. Now in this video, we wanna look at how to properly shield traces that are carrying clock signals from traces carrying data signals in a high-speed bus. There are several examples of buses that operate this way. One of the most common is of course SPI, there's also DDR, there's also EMMC, and there are parallel peripheral interfaces as well. All of them have a source synchronous clock that has its own dedicated trace. And so of course it is worth asking what is the best way to shield some of your signal traces from that clock trace, especially when you have a wide parallel bus, like for example, EMMC. Well, these high speed buses are of course impedance controlled with the exception of SPI. When you have impedance control, the method that you use to provide shielding between the clock trace and the other traces is going to really vary depending on the amount of impedance deviation that you can tolerate. Let's take a look at the LinkedIn post that brought all this up. Here I have a LinkedIn post from Sadek Kanan, and Sadek writes, some guidelines advise that the Phi TX clock signal needs to be shielded by ground traces. However, I still believe that these traces will only add more cost to your design without any actual benefits. Quite the opposite, they will increase crosstalk in some cases, especially when stitching vias are not properly placed, which can cause resonance. Instead, you could achieve the same desired result by making your traces wider and bringing your reference plane closer. Alternatively, you could find space for important signals such as clocks and route a signal coplanar for better shielding. I would love to hear your perspective on this. Now in this post, he includes an image, but you can see in this image that the net name on this trace is EMMC clock zero, not Phi TX clock as listed in the post. Now in this post, he is actually referencing two different interfaces. When he mentions Phi TX clock in the text, he's referring to media independent interface routing. And when he mentions the EMMC clock zero line in the image, that is referring to, of course, an EMMC memory interface. So they're not really the same thing, but we'll go ahead and address both of those interfaces in this video. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at some of the replies. Rene DeNoyer writes, if you want to keep the same characteristic impedance, having the reference plane closer to the signal will require making the trace more narrow, not making the trace wider. Rene is exactly right. In order to maintain the same target impedance, you would need to make the trace narrower if you were to simply bring the reference plane closer to the trace. Of course, that will ensure that you keep a constant characteristic impedance in both situations with the reference plane farther from the trace and the reference plane closer to the trace. However, you could bring the reference plane closer to the trace and allow the trace impedance to drop a little bit. And as long as the trace impedance is within the range in the interface specification, I think you're still going to be okay. So we'll investigate that later in this video. Let's take a look at some more comments. Justin Massio writes, I fully agree about vias. These planes shouldn't be left like this. It may be worse than nothing. And he provides a related video, which, hey, check it out. It's our guard traces reducing crosstalk video here on Altium Academy. So I'll include a link to that video in the description. Make sure to check it out because it does address the use of guard traces to provide shielding from crosstalk. Let's take a look at another comment. Randall Lott writes, for small designs, closer reference planes and coplanar waveguide transmission lines allow for thinner traces. This yields better signal integrity in some cases. You'll also enjoy better interplane capacitance with thinner dielectrics. Technically, this is a coplanar waveguide with ground 
or conductor-backed coplanar waveguide. Your field solver will need to consider this. I've seen many people ignore ground pours. Great point, Randall. And this does address the point made in the original post about bringing in coplanar ground. You can bring in coplanar ground, but as long as you don't bring it in too close, you won't have an effect on microstrip or strip line impedance. And yes, I have seen many people ignore the coplanar ground when calculating the impedance, including in some of our one minute design reviews. And let's look at one last comment. It's true as they say with high speed designs, ground plane proximity is the key to integrity. And I assume he is referring to signal integrity. Yes, that is true. The proximity of the ground plane is a major determinant of signal integrity. And of course it is because it also is the major determinant of impedance of those lines. And that does jive with all of the other remarks from the other commenters. So I guess the big question in this post is, how close can you bring that reference plane to that trace and still fall within the impedance tolerance range specified in the interface specification? Well, let's look at this for both interfaces that are referenced in this post. We can check it out for media independent interface routing and we can check it for EMMC routing. To get started, the first thing we're gonna have to do is look up the trace impedance values in the specification. Now here on screen, I have the Wikipedia article for media independent interface. And I don't normally go to Wikipedia as the default source for PCB design topics, but in this article, they do list the MII routing trace impedance. If you just scroll down or if you just control F your way to impedance, you will see here under the signal levels section that they do specify some impedance values for these traces. Now you can see here, there are a couple of different recommendations. For example, the IEEE version of the MII standard specifies a 68 ohm trace impedance. Now we have this other recommendation from National. I don't know which company this is, but they recommend running a 50 ohm trace with a 33 ohm series terminator. And unfortunately there is no citation for this. So if anybody knows of a citation for MII routing other than 68 ohms, make sure to post it in the comments. So for our purposes, we will just assume that 68 ohms is the target value and we'll take a generous tolerance value of plus or minus 10%. Now, what about EMMC? Well, if you go and search for EMMC routing impedance, you'll find a, a document here from Swissbit and they provide some EMMC routing guidelines. And if you just search for the word impedance, you will see here that they specify a 50 ohm trace at plus or minus 10% tolerance. So depending on the interface we're looking at, we can basically accept up to a five ohm or a 6.8 ohm deviation, assuming a 10% tolerance on the target trace impedance. Now, how can we simulate this? Well, I've shown you all how to do this very quickly in Altium Designer several times. What I am gonna do is show you how to do it in Polar because Polar does have a sensitivity analysis tool that allows you to run through several of these calculations very quickly, and then you can compare the results in the table. Let's go ahead and jump in and take a look. Now here I am inside of Polar SI9000 and one of the nice things about Polar SI9000 is that it does have a lot of these trace configurations built into it. And on top of that, it also has a sensitivity analysis tool, which I really like because it runs through a lot of calculations really quickly. So let's just take a look at this example here. We're gonna look at a coated microstrip, which would basically be like a microstrip that is coated with solder mask. And we're gonna calculate how much deviation in the thickness of this dielectric we can tolerate in order to remain within a target impedance deviation of 10% from both of our standards that we're gonna examine here. So just as an example, let's go ahead and start with the EMMC standard. Here I'm gonna start with a dielectric thickness of six mils, and we're gonna have a target impedance of 50 ohms, and I'm gonna go ahead and calculate what the width is. Now there's a preset etch factor in here that you can of course go, a, go in and change, um, but I've gone ahead and calculated the width anyways, and you can see it comes out to 10.7161 mils. Now, just for comparison, let's go into Altium Designer and calculate the width required for that same 50 ohm impedance. You can see it does come out to 10.554 mils. So a very small difference between 
the Symbior field solver in the back end of Altium Designer and the field solver here inside of Polar. Now, I think this difference does come from the etch factor. We're not going to investigate that here in this video. We'll save that as a, another topic. But for now, what I want to do is just look at what happens in terms of the sensitivity of the trace impedance to the thickness of this dielectric. And then we can see how close we can really bring that reference plane to this trace without violating the impedance constraint. So now let's set up the sensitivity analysis tool. Here what we're going to do is vary the thickness of the dielectric so you can see the parameter selected here is H1. And then we're going to vary it from let's say 3 mil up to 6 mil. And in order to get enough results, we're going to vary this by a quarter mil at a time. And if we just go ahead and click calculate, and display this as a table format, you can really start to see what happens as you start to move that reference plane closer to that trace. Now, as you can see here, as we get from six mil down to three mil, eventually the impedance of that trace is gonna drop down near 32 ohms. Now that's really low, and that's when we get down to a three mil thick dielectric starting from a six mil dielectric. Now you can see here, if we're already starting from a six mil dielectric, we can really only reduce that dielectric by about three quarters of a mil before we start to violate that impedance specification. So if you're talking about taking an existing design and moving the reference plane closer to try and shield nearby traces from crosstalk, you have to be careful with that because you may not have very much distance that you can move that reference plane without creating a violation in the impedance specification. Now for the EMMC trace that was shown in the image, that really doesn't give us a lot of confidence that we can just move the reference plane closer without changing anything about the trace. Now suppose we move the reference plane by three quarters of a mil. How much would we need to change the width of the trace by in order to ensure that we hit the same target impedance? Well, we can also do that calculation using the constant impedance mode. And if I just put in my target impedance of 50 ohms and click calculate, you see it really quickly runs through all these simulations. And then we can see exactly what happens to the width as we get down to that 5.25 mil thickness. You can see here that the width of the trace has to change to 9.27 mils at the base. So you also have to reduce the size of that trace by about one mil in width in order to maintain that constant impedance. So if you move that reference plane closer, be careful because you may not have very much margin that you can move that reference plane and still stick within that impedance specification. Now, just for comparison, let's take a look at the media independent uh, interface routing. If I go back over here and I set a trace impedance of 68 ohms, calculate the width, you can see that the trace width at the base is 5.6588 mils. So already we're starting with a much narrower trace. Then if we go back over to the sensitivity analysis and we do that same variation in the thickness of the dielectric, and I hit calculate here, we can actually see how far we can move that dielectric before we start to violate the impedance specification. And you can already see right here, we can really only move that reference plane by one mil before we reduce the impedance so much that we now fall outside of that plus or minus 10% tolerance. So even starting from a higher trace impedance and even having a larger absolute value for the impedance deviation, in this case, 6.8 ohms, we really don't have much distance that we're allowed to move that reference plane without creating too much impedance deviation. So what's the best solution for reducing crosstalk? Should you use guard traces? Can you use coplanar? Well, I would say coplanar ground can be useful because it forces you to space out the traces, but that's really the key, is spacing is the most effective tool you have for preventing crosstalk between neighboring traces. If you have large enough spacing between your traces, you won't have to resort to things like guard traces with stitching vias in order to control crosstalk. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. I get tagged in a lot of LinkedIn posts and I know they don't always make it into a video, but this was definitely a good one to address. So if you have a great idea for a video, of course you can tag me on LinkedIn or you can leave your comments and questions in the comment section. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.